story of Abraham, guys. I mean, when we talk about great patriarchs of the faith, I mean, Abraham's up at, at, really at the top of the list, right? So much so that when we talk about the God that we serve, we find in Scripture that he is known by the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I mean, wow. If we could just really get an idea of how that impacts our lives today, that the God that we serve said that he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And, and the reason why that's such a big deal in my, in my mind is because we have disassociated ourselves from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But yet, when God made covenant with Avram, became Avraham, right? When he, when he made covenant with Avram, everything changed. But the start of all of that was he believed God and he did what he said. So when we talk about faith, Avraham is a great person to, to talk about. And as we say, so I mean, are, are we saved by faith or are we saved by works? Well, we're saved by grace through faith, but guys, it's always been that way. It's never been any different. You know, Avraham, are you telling me Avraham was not redeemed? He was not, he was not born again? I believe he was. Well, how was, how was that so? Because he believed Elohim. And he did what he said. He followed him. He was in covenant with him. And God keeps covenant. Okay? And so this is a lot of things that we're going to get into uh, this week and today, possibly on Shabbat as well. But we've got a lot to really cover in here. And, and Avraham and the story of Avraham, don't forget, it's not just a story. Because the life of Avraham, we really need to find out what that means for us. Because once we do that, it'll open up the scriptures in another way. This is why it's really good to start at the beginning of the scripture and read through to the end. Not just jump around and read all over. Read it however you need to read it. But at some point, you need to start at the beginning and work your way through. Okay? So... One of the first things that we see is that Yah had spoke to Avram and he told him to change his entire life, everything he's ever known. We don't know what that's like, do we? See, he says, I'm going I'm to call you out of where you're at and I expect you to be a complete change of life, a complete change of character. Not to say that Avraham and who he was wasn't good enough. No, I'm just saying that he pulled him out of what he was involved in. Okay? And he believed the one true God, so he forsook the idols. Okay? So Yahweh is doing the same today. He's calling us out away from idolatry. Guys, he's not necessarily calling us out away from relationships. Because a lot of people have used the story of Avraham to cut and, dis and, and to cut ties with people and to disassociate with people. And it's really not what's being said. Okay? Avraham needed to move out in a way because of, of the idolatry that was involved in everything. Okay? Not necessarily because of, because of the family, but because of the idolatry that was involved in everything. Let's take a look at a couple things. Let's start off with the scripture, Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Now, Yahweh says to Avram, at that time his name was not changed yet, right? So Yahweh says to Avram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Okay. Now, people often use this in terms of Israel. You wouldn't necessarily be wrong for doing that. You know, I will bless them that bless you, curse them that curse you. But understand, Avraham was not a Jew. Because Avraham begat Yitzhak, who begat Yaakov, who begat 12 sons, okay? So one of Jacob's 12 sons was Judah, Yehuda. So those who descended from Yehuda were Yehudim. <laughs> we're Jews. Okay, so Avraham, there was no such thing at this point in time as a Jew. Avraham was someone who just believed God. Okay, and, 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 and because of this, God made covenant with him, 
And then he says, I will bless them that bless you, and I will, I will curse those who, who curse you, who dishonors you. Well, guys, who was this to? This was to Avraham and his descendants. And when we read the story of Avraham and his descendants, we learn that it's not just for those that are natural born in his house, but all those that would also be joined with him. And so we find along the way, there's a lot that have joined themselves to Abraham, joined themselves to Isaac, joined themselves to Israel, and ultimately through all these 12 tribes. But God made covenant with Avraham. And when he, when he made a covenant with Israel, he did not do away with the covenant he gave to Avraham. He built on it. Okay? So just stuff to keep in mind. Okay? So what did Yah really call him out away from so that he could show him? Sometimes we have to look at the things in our life, and I'm not saying the people in our life, I'm saying the things in our life. Sometimes we have to look at the things in our life to see what the Father is telling us, what he really wants us to see. You get my point? Because sometimes we can't see the forest for the trees. We're so caught in our current circumstance or our current surroundings and our current situation that we can't see what the Father's really wanting us to see. And so sometimes we need to take time out and get to ourselves and pray. This doesn't mean you cut off life with everybody else. It means you need to refocus. Okay? And it doesn't mean we need to blame everybody else either. Okay? We need to take a look at ourselves and see what the Father is wanting us to do in our life, right? Okay, so he told him, leave your country, your people, and your father's household. I want to share something with you in, from uh, the Zondervan Illustrated Bible Backgrounds Commentary. It says, why does God ask Avram to leave these behind? One reason may be that it's these three connections that one related to deity. All three of these things had a connection to a deity that was served. The gods that are of one worship tended to be national or city gods, or uh, principalities, regions. Okay, so they were national or city deities, or the clan god, the, the god of the family. Okay, each family had their own deity that they served, or this, or ancestral gods, that is, ancestors who have taken a place in the divine world, or the father's household. So we find that Yahweh cuts these ties so that he would have no connection to any other deities. So that he left all of these, th he left the idolatry behind to serve the one true God. And in order to do that, he, the, his area that he was in was so entrenched in the idolatry that he had to remove. Okay, now let's take a look. There, the idea of a personal God in Mesopotamia started around about 2000 BC, which is very interesting because. Abraham, uh, the story of Abraham would be around about 2000 BC. So the idea of a personal God was shaping and taking place in the time, in the region. And again, why do you think that we find things like, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Okay? It's because this is how people related. This is how people understood. This is how they knew. Okay? So in this period, people began to see themselves in a personal relationship with a family deity who undertook the divine sponsorship of the family. As a result, most family worship was directed to this God. And this became known as the God of the Father. And again, I'm not saying it's right, but I'm saying understand that Yah did use this to identify himself to his people. Right? Right? So what we find, what was Avram being called to or away? He needed to do, to, to do a complete change of himself. Okay? What he was called this. Consider Avram was fully a Mesopotamian man. He was from Mesopotamia, right? Consider that he was fully immersed in that culture. He was fully part of the thought process of the place. He was fully a part of the perspective of life that the people in this region had. Okay? And that's why he needed to remove himself from it. The command to leave the country, the birthplace, and the father's house means that he will become a completely different man. He takes on a different culture. He takes on a new occupation and a new identity. Likewise for us. When we come to the place of living according to the Torah, it changes our total identity and our mindset. 
I was sharing, this was a, a conversation I had with Barry Phillips who were talking about this. And it's, it's a completely different change. It, it's, it's the idea of once we come to the Father, the old things are passed away and all things are new. So we don't want to identify with the things of our former selves, with the things of the world or the, or, the, or the things of that life. We want to identify as being renewed, remade, being made whole, to being restored in the eyes of the Father, to be a part of His kingdom, not the earthly kingdom, right? That's why we find, like 2 Corinthians 5, 17, so therefore if anyone is, is united with the Messiah, he is a what? New creation, old things have passed away, and the all things are new. So the idea is this, do you believe that Abraham was united with the Messiah? I do. Because Yah was in covenant with Abraham, which meant... Yeshua was there. When the covenant was cut and the covenant was made, Yeshua was there. I'm not really going to go into that today, but what, who passed between the pieces when the covenant was set? Did Abraham? Abraham did not pass between the pieces at all. So who did? Yah and Yeshua. That's why Yeshua could be a, a guarantor for the covenant on behalf of Abraham and extend that to the nations. Because Abraham and his strength could not do that. But because Yeshua did, he could stand in a place to extend that covenant to all who would be joined with. Okay, That's about that much of something that's that big. Okay, <laughs> So the question is, whose will do we seek? Do we seek Yah's will or do we seek our own? Do we seek our own desires or do we seek his? Now, we could say, well, I'm just trying to better my life or better my situation, or and that's okay. But do we put the things that we desire above what God asked us to do? And anything that we put in a higher place in our life than what the Father has asked us is taking the place of an, of, of an idol. It's taking a, a place of idolatry in our life. So who do we really serve? And it's like, well, we could say we serve Yahweh, but yet, when he says things like, the seventh day is Shabbat, I want you to gather. It's a holy convocation. I want my people together. Or the Moedim. Or very simply, just follow me. You know? So when he puts us in a place like that, that is seen in our daily life. Because like you can say anything, but yet faith has an action associated with it. You know, you can't just say, I believe and not act on what we believe. Okay, A lot of times, people won't remember you by what you thought. They'll remember you by what you did. Okay, All right. So whose will do we seek? Genesis 11.4 says, So then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. Look at this. Let us make a name for who? ourselves lest we be dispersed over the face of the earth so he said let us make a name for ourselves so we won't be dispersed all over the earth but yet what did Yah tell them to do when they came out of the ark he said multiply fill the earth right and and man said we don't want to we like it here <laughs> yeah. Galatians 3 29 says so also if you belong to the Messiah you are the seed of Abraham and heirs according to the promise if you are the seed of Abraham, you are heirs according to the promise. What promise? The promise of the covenant that God made with Abraham. So we're a partaker of that. So do we serve ourselves or do we serve the God of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov? Do we serve the God of Israel? And how can we say we serve the God of Israel if we can't stand Israel? So a very interesting thing is there. We read two verses one through three. Verse four says something really interesting. It says, so Avram went as Yahweh told him. And Lot went with him. <laughs> I, I, I want to point something out. I'm not saying Lot was unrighteous because we actually read where Peter was talking about Lot and he said that it was Lot, Lot who was righteous. His, his righteous soul was crying out in the midst of, of Sodom and because of what was going on there. But yet, I don't think that the, the Lot pronounced Lot in Hebrew, I, I don't think that he really fully understood the idea of the covenant that was happening here. Okay? 
that to leave to go with Abraham meant a complete change of everything, not just an opportunity for a different life or just an opportunity for, for to see adventure or, or just to say, wow, God said he's going to bless him. I want some of that. Hmm. It seems that Lot was very opportunistic. I'm not saying he was unrighteous. I'm, not say, I'm just saying it seemed that he was very opportunistic and was more concerned with the blessing of the covenant without the requirement of the covenant. Okay, Matthew 6, 19 to 21. So don't lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is... There your heart will be also. So we, we're given examples of things, and we'll cover a little more about later, but Lot seemed to just make business decisions for what he felt was best for him and his family. And I'm not, you know, like I said, I'm not beating up on Lot here, okay? I'm just saying that this is a good example for us. What are our pursuit in life? What are the things that we're doing? Yeshua says, to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Then all these things will be added to you. So are we seeking the things? Are we just saying, well, I just want the blessing of the covenant, but I don't want the responsibility of covenant. Guys, I, I, I got news to share with you. Covenant comes with accountability and it comes with responsibility. And if you don't believe that, have that conversation with your wife. <laughs> I'm telling you. Covenant comes with responsibility and it comes with accountability. Okay? And if and if we say, well, we want the blessings of covenant, but we don't want the responsibility or we don't want the accountability, you really don't understand covenant at all. Okay? Isaiah 25, 6 through 8. On this mountain, Yahweh Sava'ot will make for all people a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined, and he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all the people, the veil that is spread over all the nations. That's interesting. Keep that in mind as we, as we get later into this study. He says there's a veil that is cast over, spread over all the nations, and this veil will go away. When this happens, he will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all the faces and the reproach of his people he will take away from the earth, for Yah has spoken. So he's saying, when, as we pursue him, he will bring us to himself, and then we will have blessing of covenant. But until that time, is the blessing he gives us today good enough? Is the provision of the covenant he gives us today good enough? Or are we always seeking, God, I know what you've given me today, but I don't, I'm not happy with that. I want more. You know? There was a difference of vision that we see the result of between Abraham and Lot. There was a difference of vision. Yahweh came to Abraham and said, I'm going to show you this place. Lot says, Wow, yeah, I'll go with you. There's a difference of vision here. They may be going towards the same place. They may be heading in the same direction, but they do not have the same goal and intent. And it carries its way and works to those who worked for them, who were in their households. This thought process, because this was, this was them, Lot and Avram, and it worked its way into those who worked for them. Make sense? Because a leader will cast vision, right? A leader will say, this is our mission statement. This is where we're heading. This is where we're going. And what Avram said wasn't quite the same as what Lot said. Abraham, I will make you a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, curse those who curse you. All of this will be in you, and, and you're going to have this land. I'm going to show you this land. It's going to be awesome. And Lot's standing on the side going, hey, I want to get in on that. And then the guys that are going with Lot saying, hey guys, you want, you want some of this too? Man, you come out here and we'll just live up the life. We'll have it all together. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but you get the point, right? Genesis 13, 7. 
So there was strife between the herdsmen of Avram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock at the time the Canaanites and the Perizzites were dwelling in the land. Then Avram said to Lot, let there be no strife between you and me and between your herdsmen and my herdsmen, for we are kinsmen. So far, so good, right? I mean, he says, well, I don't want any strife between us. I don't want there to be any problems between us. That would have been a great opportunity for Lot to say, yeah, how can we fix it? It's not the way it happened, is it? But yet, we know that the Father desires for us to walk in unity. We know that he desires for us to learn to walk together. So when there's quarreling, when there's strife, when there's contention, when there's things that happen, see, we're quick to just say, that's it, get over, separate, done. Because we don't understand covenant. But yet, God is saying, because of covenant, you work it out. Psalm 133, 1. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. Gam yachad, right? Together in unity. Proverbs 20, verse 3. Avoiding quarrels brings a person honor, because any fool can explode in anger. That's good, you know? Because how often, how often do we just want to just explode? You know, one of the fruits of the Spirit is self-control, right? Matthew 5, 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, and they're not talking about the one you carry on your hip. Although I don't have a problem with that either. <laughs> it says, they shall be called the children of God. James 1.20, a person's anger does not accomplish God's righteousness. Because God desires for us to walk in His righteousness, He desires for us to be a people to learn to walk together, and, and, to, and to be a unity of heart, unity of purpose. And, and when we get angry, we don't care about anything else other than why we're angry. And when we're angry, I don't think, I, I, I mean, I could be completely wrong on this, but I don't think our first tendency as human beings when we get angry is to stop and say, is this showing forth the glory of Yah in the kingdom in my anger? No, we try to justify our anger and we, and we go off on it, right? <laughs> kind of like when Yah came to Jonah and he says, hey, are you, are you right to be angry because of this 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 plant that came up and when it was gone in a day, and Jonah's like, yeah, I got a right to be angry about it. Wow. Because that affected him. Selfish. You know? And we can all do that in our, uh, if we're not careful, we can all do that too. Okay? We need to be minded more so on the kingdom. Right? Okay. So back to Genesis 13, verse 9. So is not the whole land before you, Separate yourself from me. If you take the left, then I will go to the right. Or if you take the right, I will go to the left. Here's the thing. Lot still could have said, you know what, Avram? God said he's going to bless you. He says he's got, he's got covenant with you. I'm going to stick with you. Let's deal with this situation. Okay? But no, Lot looked up, and he lifted his eyes, and he saw the Jordan Valley, and it was well watered. And it, it looked like a great place to be, right? I mean, he started like daydreaming, you know? I'm going to put a diving board over there, and, <laughs> right? I can water the flocks over there, build a house over there. And so what he looked, he looked out, and in his mind, he was making a good business decision. Something that would benefit, benefit his life, benefit his family, make a good benefit for his business, because he had cattle, right? He had, he had herds. And so to make it just a good decision. But yet, at what point did he stop? And he looked up, and, and do we find, he looked up to, to Yahweh and says, where would you like for me to go? He didn't say that. And, and further, if he did that, maybe God would have said, well, I want you to stick with Avram. Don't know. I mean, it's kind of like he didn't tell him to go in the first place, but since he's here, right? Keep in mind something here's, here as well, that when, when Yah pulled Avram out of where he was, he sent him to where he was taking him. Now, he didn't know where that was yet, but he sent him to where he was taking him. He didn't send Lot. Lot just went. Y Yah sent Abraham with a blessing. Lot wanted to take something 
to be, to be a part of something that really didn't belong to him. And so he, he saw an opportunity and just went. At what point do we find where Lot says, Yeah, creator of everything, he who called Avraham, how can I join with this? You know? So he looked up and he saw this, and Lot chose for himself all the Jordan Valley, and Lot journeyed east. Keep that in mind. Lot journeyed east, thus they separated from each other. And Abraham settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot, while Lot settled among the cities of the valley and moved his tent as far as Sodom. Okay, so Lot was able to choose where he would go, and he made the choice based on what he saw. The land was good, no doubt, but the people were corrupt. Oh, yeah, but all that matters is that they had a great economy. But the people are wicked. 1 Corinthians 15.33 tells us, Don't be fooled. Bad company ruins good character. A lot of times, oh, but I can go in and I can be a light to these people. And I, but you're the only one? <laughs> I'm not saying it can't be done, okay? But I'm saying the likelihood is they're going to have an effect on you. Genesis 13, 11. So again, we find. So Lot chose this, and he journeyed east, is Mekedim. He says he journeyed Mekedim, which is interesting because this is the same type of uh, terminology we find when people moved on their way to build the tower. It says they journeyed from Yahweh, they journeyed Mekedim, they journeyed from Yahweh, they journeyed from he who was the ancient of days, him who was of from old, they journeyed away from him to say, I'm going to build something for my name. I'm going to build up something for me and my family. And it seems that Lot had the same attitude. Hmm. So again, where is our heart? Where is our pursuit? We need to be careful of the things that our eyes tend to find. You know, the things that we pursue and the things that we go after. Our goals that we set for ourselves. The things that we search on the internet. The books that we read. The teachers you let teach you. There has to be some good, good, strong discernment in a lot of this. Okay? Because there are people who are sowing into your life. And it may be nothing, just a seed. But what can that seed produce down the road once it starts to flourish? A mustard seed is all it takes. Right? For great faith, a mustard seed is all it takes. Guys, uh, the same applies the other way. So in our choices and in our decisions, what is our underlying thought process? In our choices and the things we do daily and the things that we pursue, the teachings that we go after, are what is our thought process in doing so? Okay? This reveals our pursuit and it reveals the things that we really consider goals and the things that we really consider important in our life. Here's, so, here's, here's something to consider. Are we searching the scripture to learn the heart of the Father? Or are we trying to find the next grouping of people that are lying to us about something? Are we trying to search to find the heart of Yahweh to learn to walk in His ways? Or are we searching the Scripture to find out, well, i got to find out where all the false prophets are. If you know Yahweh and you're pursuing Him, you don't have to worry about the false prophets. He will take care of the false prophets. Okay? Because He promised that. But our pursuit and, and, and our looking, we can, we can become so easily distracted that all it takes is just a little bit, and all of a sudden, we spend our time pursuing other things instead of the Word of Yah itself. And we're now we're pursuing, and, and, the, and we say we're pursuing truth. No, you're pursuing lies. Seek Yahweh. Pursue Him. Understanding that when we're looking in the Word and we're, when we're reading the Word and we're letting that become a part of us, it's going to change us. It's going to better the kingdom. It's going to better uh, the, our life and the lives around us. How are a, a lot of these lies really going to impact my relationship with the Father? My relationship with you? 
but yet we focus on the lies. I believe the adversary has done a great job of distracting us. Where we keep our focus is what we feed into our soul. So where we keep our focus is where we're going to grow. Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep your heart with all uh, vigilance because from it flows the springs of life, the rivers of life. So will we be growing in faith or fear? Will Will we be growing in love or anger? Will we be building up the body in unity or will we be bringing divisiveness to, some, to, 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 the, to the body? Are we seeking things that pursue edification and to build up or are we seeking things based out of fear? Because a lot of the stuff that's out there, let's face it guys, fear is a great, uh, it draws attention. It gets a lot of people. And the fear of what someone is taking from me, hmm, that's a big one. Should our pursuit be on the fear? And at the same time, I'm not saying we're naive, and I'm not saying that, that there aren't people out there that are, that are doing things that, believe me, but at the same time, where should our pursuit be? Yeshua says, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. He didn't say, seek first all these false prophets and what they're telling us. It's tough, isn't it? 1 Thessalonians 5.21 Test everything. Hold fast to what is good. The battle cry of the conspiracy theorists. Believe me, guys. Like I said, I, 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 I don't believe every conspiracy is wrong. I don't believe everyone is right. Okay? (laughs) <laughs> but at the same time, is that our focus? See? Because when he says test everything and hold fast to what is good, the, in the context of this, it is that which is coming forth in the midst of the assembly in the congregation. So test our hearts. Test the things that are coming forth. Testing these things that are good. Okay? What is the fruit of the behavior? What is the fruit of our pursuit? If it's fear-driven or, here's a big one that we don't think about, is it offense-based? Are the things that we're pursuing, we're pursuing this because they lied to me. We're offended with this, so we're going over here, but yet we have not dealt with that offense, which leaves us an open door for more offense and further hurt down the road. See, we have to learn to pursue the heart of the Father above all else. We need to learn to build the kingdom, to build up the body, and learn to work in unity instead of trying to divide everybody all the time. Who who, is the one who tries to divide? He's called the accuser of the brethren. When we're always trying to divide the body, we are lining ourselves up with Hasatan. When we're constantly walking in fear, we're not having the faith that the Father is giving us so that we can seek Him. So that we can pursue Him. Because He said He equips us to do so. Okay? Galatians 5, 19 to 23. Galatians 5, we talk about the, the, the fruit of the Spirit, right? But what comes before that? Works of the flesh. Or the fruit of the flesh. Right? What does it read? So now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality. Okay, nobody here's got a problem with that, right? Well, what else does it say? Idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy. If you spend five minutes on Facebook, you see all of it. <laughs> and, it's, and it's disguised as, oh, I'm just telling the truth. Do we say what we say because we genuinely care about the people or do we say what we say because they're wrong or do we say what we're saying because I'm right? Are we showing the fruit of the Spirit or are we working in our own strength, in our own hurt, in our own offense, in our own uh, drive for something else? And it can be disguised as, well, I'm just pointing towards the truth. Then why are you always pointing to the lie? So, I warn you, as I warned you before, those things who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is 
Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. If the things that we're doing, that we're pursuing, is producing these things, that's what we should be doing. If they're producing the other things, we need to watch. Because the things that we're putting in us is the things that we, get, that we give. Right? Garbage in? James 3.13. So who is wise and understanding among you? By his what? Good conduct. Let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but it is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. Disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom that, that is from above is first what? Pure, then what? Peaceable, then gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown, how? In peace by those who what? Make peace. So are we striving to do the things that make peace? Or are we striving to do the things to cause the next blow up somewhere? You know? Where is our heart really? And I think it requires a really good uh, examination of our real thoughts and intents. You know? We may be well intentioned, but you got caught up in the distractions. You know? The glittering lights, angel of light, the things that just pull us all over the place. Proverbs 23 6. Eat not the bread of him that has an evil eye, neither desire his dainty meats. For he, as he thinks in his heart, so is he. In other words, a selfish man, a stingy man, a proud man, a boastful man, all of this applies in here. But, he's, but even though he tells you, no, eat and drink, it's great, have on. But yet, at the same time, with every bite you take, he's, he's holding contempt for you because you're taking his stuff. <laughs> no, really, no, it's fine, have, take whatever you want. How come he took the big one? Huh? So this, this is where it's going. Colossians 3.12 Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with what? Feelings of compassion, with kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with one another. Not be a bear with one another. <laughs> okay? Bear with one another. If anyone has a complaint against someone else, be sure to tell somebody else. Oh, no, it's not what it says. It says, forgive him. And indeed, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must forgive. Above all these, clothe yourselves with what? Love, which binds everything together perfectly. And let the shalom which comes from the Messiah be your heart's decision maker. Let shalom be your decision maker. Don't let fear make your decision. Don't let the world make your decision. Don't let the next conspiracy make your decision. Don't let the next sensational teaching make your decision. Let the shalom that comes from the Messiah be your decision maker. So, this is why you were called, look at this, to be part of a single body and be thankful. You were not called to be part of bodies. You were called to be part of a single body of a people that is called collectively Israel. So you are part of a single body. In other words, how can we identify and do this? We were called to be a part of a single body, to dwell in shalom, to dwell in peace. How can we do that if we're too busy trying to find each other's faults? Titus 3.8 the saying is trustworthy, and I want, to, I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to what? Good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. But what? Avoid 
foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. As for a person who stirs up division, well, what do you mean by division? Someone who is doing these things that were just said. Okay? So as for a person who stirs up division after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him. Don't feed his ego. Isaiah 8, 11, For the Lord spoke to me this with a strong hand upon me, and he warned me not to walk in the way of this people, saying, Do not call conspiracy all that this people calls conspiracy, and do not fear what they fear, nor be in dread. But the Yahweh said, Va'ot, Him you shall honor as holy. Let him be your fear. Let him be your dread. The word there, conspiracy, some translations say confederacy. Some say alliance. Guys, what do you think a conspiracy is? Conspiracy is saying there is a group of people that are aligning themselves together for a common purpose to rule over us somehow. Conspiracy. <laughs> so what he's saying is, don't worry about these people who are trying to make conspiracies and are trying to form alliances that are not of God and are trying to do these things. Let Yahweh be your fear. Revere Him. Let Him be the one you follow. Don't let these things be what you follow. Let Him be the one you follow. And then we find things like in Psalm 2, why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? Well, isn't that kind of what we were just talking about? Right? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against Yahweh and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. What does verse 4 say? He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. So if we're constantly being scared or being driven by the next you know, controversy, we just need to put it aside and have faith in Yah because He laughs at their plans. He will rule. He overcomes all. Okay? I say don't even waste your time with a lot of this stuff. Philippians 4. Do not be anxious about anything. And when we start getting involved in all this fear-driven stuff, what happens? Anxiety. Right? Right? Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Yeshua. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think on these things. Now, the, 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 the things that we read the books about, the things that we search in, on, online, and the things that we involve ourselves in, the teachers we listen to, are they following this? And if not, stop. Stop. Verse 9. While you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. So, what we find, there was a difference of vision between Abraham and Lot, right? And it, we, we said it even carried the way into those that were in their households, right? The strife was between their shepherds. It, it says, specifically says the shepherds, right? So, those who had a position of authority that were there with the flocks. So, this was people, they had competing ways of life. They had two completely different outlooks on life, two completely different ideologies in the houses, competing flocks, the, the teaching that was in the houses were different, all these things were going on, and that's caused a division. Division. Die, die vision between them, and Abraham would not be able to clearly see the vision because of distraction. Because Lot was there, and he couldn't see what God was trying to show him wanting to do this because there was always a distraction. Can you imagine, like, much like this, Moses goes to the tent of meeting to talk to the Father, and here comes Joshua knocking, hey man, these guys, are, you're fighting, they want to talk to you. <laughs> Granted, that didn't happen, okay? But, but it's that type of a thing, right? Look at this. Look at the meaning of Lot's name. The meaning of Lot's name is a veil or a covering. Think about that for a second. Lot was veiling what Yah was wanting to show Avram. 
And the, and the decisions that Lot was doing was occupying Avraham's time, and this was veiling what needed to be done or what God wanted to show him. Lot and his herdsmen refused to submit themselves to Avraham to walk in the covenant God was giving to Avraham, to walk in the ways that Avraham was saying. And because of that, they separated. 2 Corinthians 3.14 so what is more, their minds were made stone-like, for to this day a, what? Veil lies over them when they read the Old Covenant. It's not been unveiled because in Messiah the veil is taken away. So till today, whenever Moshe is read, a veil lies over their heart. But, says the Torah, whenever one turns to Adonai, what? The veil goes away. In Avraham's case, he was following Yahweh, but there was a veil there that was keeping him from seeing clearly what he needed to see. And something happened when the veil was removed. What was happening? What, 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 what went on? What happened when the veil was removed? Immediately, the next verse, Yahweh says to Avram, after Lot had separated from him, lift up your eyes. How fast was that? Lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, westward. For all the land you see, I will give to you and your offspring forever. I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth, so that if one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring can also can be counted. Arise, walk through the length and the breadth of the land, and I will give it to you. So Avram moved his tent and came and settled by the oaks of Mamre, which is there in Hebron, and he built an altar. Yah. Immediately after the veil was removed, he looked up, and God showed him the promise. And then he says, see this? Yep, I want you to walk in it now. And he got up. And he started to move. Wow. So after they separated, Yahweh showed them the land. And I want to make, I want to make a very clear distinction here. Note who left. Who left? Lot left. Abraham didn't leave. Lot left. Okay? So we find sometimes there are, are things or people in our life that will distract us from how we are supposed to walk. We use this as an excuse to cut ties with those who we're not getting along with right now. Or we use this to say, well, we just don't agree, so I can't have anything to do with that. Really? This is not an excuse to leave people, families, or relationships because we don't agree or are arguing or we don't like to be around each other. Okay? Lot left because of the fighting, the arguing, the strife, the contention, and all of this was going on, and they were not willing to to settle it. That's a character flaw, guys. That's not the will of God. Right? Hebrews 12, 14. Strive for peace with everyone. It doesn't say strive with peace for those you like. It doesn't say strive with peace for those you agree with. Strive for peace with everyone. And for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and it may, it may many become defiled. It says, if we allow a root of bitterness to spring up, it will defile not just us, but others around us too. So strive for peace with everyone. We're told to do good to those around us, but especially the household of faith. To do good to all, but especially the household. It doesn't say do good to those who you just want to. Now, now, Abraham was in the position to have the land revealed. And he tells him, so get up and walk through the length and the breadth of the land because I will give it to you. Deuteronomy eleven twenty four 24 says, Every place where the soles of your feet shall tread on will be yours. From the wilderness, the Lebanon, to the river, the river Euphrates, even to the uttermost parts of the sea, it shall be. Yehoshua, 1, 3, Every place the sole of your foot shall tread upon, I have given to you, as I have said to Moshe. Think about this, guys. The reason why this promise was given to Israel, the reason why Yahashua was told to do the same, was because Avraham went in and walked the, 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 the length and the breadth of the land. God says, I want, I'm going to give you this land, you, all the land that you see, yes. Get up and walk it. And wherever he walked, the land was given to Israel. What if he would have just walked a mile and says, I'm tired? <laughs> Understand that sometimes God is asking you to do something not for you. He's asking you to do something for those who will come behind you. He's asking you to make a way for those who need you to make a way for them. Sometimes he will call you to be the pioneer. 
Sometimes he will call you to take those steps. And it's not to leave everything behind. It's to make sure there's a provision of covenant that is being established. And you are working towards the kingdom goals. It's not about I got my feelings hurt and I have to leave. When Yahweh calls you, He will equip you to fulfill that call. So, to walk that call requires faith and obedience. Many people think that faith is blessing. I have faith, so there's blessing. Well, there's steps in between that. Faith does bring blessing. But there's things in there that we're missing. Like, faith is belief. Because we believe, it leads to action. Read Hebrews chapter 11. Every time it says, by faith, so-and-so did something. Okay? So, faith, which is belief, it's the same word there. By the way, faith and belief is the same word. So, faith is an action which establishes obedience. If we're doing what God says, that's obedience. And the obedience, therefore, produces blessing. So, yes, faith brings blessing. But we're missing the steps in there. Because we have faith, we do what he said. Because we're doing what he said, we're being obedient to what he's desiring. Therefore, there's blessing there. Let's like he says in the scripture. Choose your path. Choose your way. If you do this, there is a life of blessing. If you do this, there's no blessing. See, we make the choices. James 2, 17 to 21. So even so, faith, if it has not works, is dead being alone. So a man might say, you have faith, I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. So you believe there is one God. Awesome! The devils believe, and they tremble. Isn't it sad that, that <laughs> the demons have more reverence for Yah than a lot of believers? Twenty. But will you know, O vain man, that faith without works is... Dead. So was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Yitzhak on the altar? Again, because of faith, there was an action associated with it. So the blessings passed on because why? Because Abraham believed. And because Abraham believed, it led to his course of life and the way he did things. And the way he raised his household. And the way he brought up his kids. And the way he interacted with those around him. Okay? What was the testimony of his belief? Well, we find later, Genesis 26, 5, right? It says that Yahweh is speaking to descendant of Abraham and saying, I will bless you because Abraham. He didn't say, I'm going to bless you because you're just such a great guy. I like you. He said, I'm going to bless you because Abraham did something. And it wasn't just Abraham's actions. It was acting on covenant. Okay? Because the actions Abraham took were covenant actions. So what did he do? Abraham obeyed my voice. That's Shema. Abraham, Shema. Abraham kept my charge. That's Mishmarti. mishmarti. Shamar is the root word. Shamar is to keep, to guard, to protect. Shomer is a watchman. Okay? My commandments. Mitzvotai. Mitzvot are the commands. And my statutes, hukotai, hok, or huka, depending on, you know, the form. But the same word, hok. These are the things that are translated in Scripture as statutes, decrees, ordinances, or customs. And then, and my Torah. So because Abraham did this because Abraham walked upright because Abraham heard my voice the things that were important to me were important to him the things that I desired for him to do he walked he kept my 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 word he kept what I taught him when I instructed him he did it and all of this was called belief or having faith because we says Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Well, how did Abraham believe God? The testimony from Yahweh himself is Genesis 26, 5. How did he believe God? He did what he said. 
Genesis 17, 1. When Avram was 99 years old, Adonai appeared to Avram and he said, I am El Shaddai, God Almighty. Walk in my presence and be pure hearted. Walk before me and be perfect, is how some translations put it. Where perfect doesn't mean sinless, it means upright, a pure heart, right? So he says, walk before me, live a life before Yahweh. How? With a pure heart. Not to be defiled with the world and the ways of it, but a pure heart, seeking him in all, in all his ways. Psalm 24, 3. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? He who has what? Clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. He will receive blessing from Yahweh and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Selah. Matthew 5, 8 and 9. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. 1 Peter 1.22 says, Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth. Focus on that. Focus on a heart to be obedient to the truth. For a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from pure heart. Learn to walk in His ways. Seek Him above all else. Pursue the kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things. Gratitude. All right? All right, let's all stand.